All right, thank you everybody for doing this. Thank you for coming. I promised you, those of you who were here earlier at the NATSEC conference, that this would be sort of part two. So this is sort of part two. Uh, my chapter uh, is on just war uh, within Protestant social teaching, and it sounds like a discrete topic, like a, 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 spe a very specific topic. Uh, and in some ways it is. But in this brief sort of introduction to that chapter, I want to propel us toward the notion that in light of the rest of the book, the topic of just war isn't actually all that discreet, but it shares uh, a large degree of affinity with, with the rest of the topics. But I'm going to start in Poland, and specifically in the town of Oswiecim in southwest Poland, which is probably better known by the German name of Auschwitz. And I'm going to get a little autobiographical. I, I introduced the chapter with a little bit of autobiography. We don't all have to bring autobiography tonight, but if you'd like to, we could take it in the Q&A. Uh, here I was, you can imagine me, sort of a dying atheist, right? I kind of knew the whole thing about God and the gospel and all that was true. I wasn't terribly keen on it being true. And so I went overseas to try to get out of my comfort zone and avoid the whole conversion thing. So I, you know, as I said, I was an atheist, so I hadn't read the book of Jonah. I didn't know you couldn't go overseas and avoid God, <laughs> right? And then I did a dangerous thing. I go to Auschwitz, and a part of the, the, the deeper background is I was becoming a Christian through a study of the Holocaust, because here I am encountering what I could only term enormous evil. And I was challenged by a Christian friend that I had no category to adjudicate evil right, from goodness, from anything else. It was just my opinion. And I wanted my, sh my fist shaking at Auschwitz to be saying something about Auschwitz and not just my opinion. All right, so in the words of Oz Guinness, God damn it, for me, God damn this place, was an unwitting prayer. I didn't know it, but it was the first prayer I ever really gave. But here I am. It's the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I was there with a friend at the ceremonies commemorating this event. And at the end of the formal ceremonies, they committed to reading all of the names of the lost until all of those names were exhausted. And this is a little bit of a hypothetical because we don't have all the names of the estimated 1.2 million lives that were taken in Auschwitz. But if we imagine that we did, and if we imagine that they read all 1.2 million names, I wanted to know after that ceremony how long that reading of names continued because it was there long after I left. I was there for several hours. The names are being read over the loudspeaker. I walk away following the tracks back to town. The names are you know, dwindling away in the distance. So how long did it take to read 1.2 million names? And I worked it out over a beer in a Polish pub with a friend who's better at math than I am. And we estimated the following, that if it took one second to read every, to, to read one name, so 1.2 million seconds works out to 13.8 days, all right? 13.8 13 days, almost a fortnight of an unbroken litany of lost lives. And here I am, an atheist, with no categories to adjudicate any of this. Uh, but I want somebody to fix this, and I want a system of thought that's capable of helping me understand how it is that as a responsible human being who wants to love my neighbor, I can contribute to fixing this toward that human flourishing that Brad has talked about, right? What can I do? And I didn't sort of know it at the time, but I was encountering what, is, what I've heard since called the naive impression of evil. And naive here isn't a pejorative like it is for us. Naive here is in the old French original word, which means something that's untutored or something that's untaught. You don't need to be told this thing, you just know it. So the naive impression of evil is made up of three things. I discuss it, I think, here. I might not. If I didn't, I should have. Bad editing if I didn't do that. Um, it's made up of three overlapping but distinct things. It's made up of an awareness first that something that ought not to be is. Something that ought not to be is. We call that evil. Right? The second thing is that we prefer what ought to be over what ought not to be. So we prefer goodness over evil. This is just innate. Right? I saw it in my two-year-old when he first experienced a, a punch on the playground. He just knew this should not be. Right? <laughs> and I knew it too when I made the other kid aware of it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so there's an awareness of what ought not to be but is. There's a preference for what ought to be. And then hard on the heels of both, there's a desire that, that strikes like tinder and desires remedy. I want somebody to fix this, right? So I didn't know it at the time, but there, 
you know, with this idea and this desire for remedy, was my own political theology developing long before I became a Christian. All right, and I think that at the heart of political theology, it's trying to ask that question. What went wrong? Who can fix it when? Right, that's, that's the heart of it. These are the, the essential questions. So to make a long story short, in the, in the book, I begin talking about uh, the responsibilities of being made in the image of God, as, as Brad talked about. What does it mean to exercise dominion, which is providential care? So hence the, we don't have it here, hence the name of the magazine, Providence, that is providential care over creation, right? What does it mean to exercise this kind of responsibility for our world? What is the role of government in it? Brad touched on this. What is the role in light of government uh, and human beings as God's vice regents? Uh, what is human responsibility? Um, how is human responsibility, as I touched on today, how is human responsibility enacted when goods seem to conflict, right? So what do we do? And into this tradition or this series of questions comes the just war tradition as a way of adjudicating when it is right to use force to overcome evil, um, how it is that human beings acting re both faithfully and responsibly ought to use this force in ways that generate more good than harm and as ways that are faithful to scripture. What do we do with this? So the Hebraic tradition is just a ground for helping human beings be responsible within the context of history. So all of this is a conundrum, of course. Um, the just war tradition sanctions war, but the problem is, is that somebody has to fight it. And so the question that I'm often asked uh, when I talk about just war, people will ask me, how can you, a Christian, sanction killing somebody made in the image of God? How do you do that? And it's a good question. It's an essential question. But I've learned to turn the question around and say, that's not, that's not actually the interesting question. The interesting question is, what am I supposed to do as a Christian when one image of God is kicking in the face of another image of God and they will not stop, right? So what do I do as a Christian to prevent 14 days of names? Or what, what, what do I do about that? I know that I am supposed to love both the guy kicking in the face of the neighbor and the neighbor getting his face kicked in. Right? I know I'm supposed to love both of them. This is clear. I know that it's also not enough to say, OK, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to love the one neighbor, let's call him the enemy neighbor, later. And I'm going to love the innocent neighbor now. Like, that's not acceptable, right? I'm supposed to love both of them in the same moment at the same time. But it's pretty clear I can't love them both in exactly the same way in exactly the same time. So into that conundrum comes the just word tradition to try to help us work all that out. Um, I do a 30,000 foot uh, overview with a history of just word teaching, starting very briefly with the Greco-Roman classical heritage, moving in through Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, who talks about the goods of government. And then naturally, I rest within the Reformation. Um, I go over some of the key figures that are there. Uh, I make a distinction a little bit, or identify a distinction between maybe Martin Luther and John Calvin. And it's a distinction that was, that was operative then. And I think it's a distinction that is operative now within Protestant thinking about social teaching, and particularly about war. Um, you could see it in, in Martin Luther's bifurcation of the two kingdoms, right? There's the spiritual kingdom. It's ruled by the Holy Spirit. There's the temporal kingdom, which is all about the restraint of the wicked, and that sometimes these kingdoms are in tension, right? But that Christians acting responsibly and lovingly submit to the rules of the government um, out of love for their neighbors. So there's love and there's fidelity, and that's a good thing. But in doing so, they might sometimes have to do things that ought never to be done um, for the sake of obedience to the king and of love for their neighbor. Right? But this whole doing of things that ought not to be done results in a certain tension, I think, within uh, Martin Luther, uh, that sometimes you do things that ought never to be done because they are necessary to be done. Right? And that's a tension that I'll, I'll, I'll illuminate in, in just a moment. And then against that, you've got John Calvin, who sees uh, maybe a, a tighter uh, or, or less of a tension between Christian obedience to the king, because Christian obedience to the king, uh, if it results in the saving of our neighbors' lives, is a positive good. It's not a negative good. In this sense, he says there's no moral difference between murder and failing to save someone from murder when you would be able to. So he sees it as a positive good without the tension maybe that Martin Luther had. And you fast forward to today, 
And within a lot of just word teaching, uh, there's maybe what we would call the Niberian stream, and I touched on this earlier today, if you were there, where, uh, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr, um, I'll sometimes say provocatively, Reinhold Niebuhr was a pacifist. And if you know Reinhold Niebuhr, you might be surprised and be couching him this way, because it was Reinhold Niebuhr almost alone that pushed the mainline churches into supporting the war against Hitler and Japanese militarism. So how can I say that a man like him was a pacifist? Well, that's because he was. Uh, but why do I think he was, or why do I identify that he was? He had two laws that were operative, and they might remind you of some of the bifurcations that Luther made. But he believed that operative on Christians was the law of love. And this is the law that you see in the Gospels. This is the law of Jesus. And the law of love isn't nonviolence. It's non-resistance. He thinks to resist evil in any way um, is a violation of the law of love. Right? You could get more into that in Q&A, or you could just read the chapter and see it, see it illuminated. Set against that law of love is a competing law, which is the law of responsibility. And this is where, given the conditions of the world, you have to act responsible for the welfare of your neighbor and the welfare of your neighbor's neighborhood. But these two laws are in tension. But Niebuhr recognized that if you pursue the law of love, given the conditions of the world, you're never going to get love. And you're going to probably bail out on responsibility as well. But if you pursue responsibility, and you season it with love where you can, you'll get a degree of responsibility, and you might get some love thrown in. So he went with the law of responsibility, believing Christians should act responsibly in the world, fighting Hitlerism, fighting Japanese militarism. But that, like Luther, came at a tremendous cost. And the cost was the incurment of guilt and sin. He believed you could not act responsibly in history without staining your soul, dirtying your hands, and incurring guilt. Um, I close the chapter by reflecting on the tragedy and the crisis of this in light of what we now understand to be called moral injury. Moral injury is a proposed subset of post-traumatic stress disorder. And within war fighters, moral injury manifests when one does or allows to be done something that goes, a deeply that goes against a deeply held moral belief. And too many American Christians are growing up with the belief that killing is wrong, period. But in war, it is necessary. And so you get this love, responsibility, tension. Right? And so the very business of war fighting becomes morally injurious. And the reason this is the crisis is that moral injury is the number one predictor for soldier suicide. So our veterans are dying by their own hands long after firefights are over because they believe that what they have done um, makes them incompatible with uh, the life that a holy God calls them to. And so in here, I go through solutions to this from Protestant uh, political thought uh, and I try to help, uh, I try to bring us to a point where we recognize that there is no distinction between the law of love, the law of responsibility. Um, they could be coterminous. Uh, it's in this sense that I don't think that my chapter is particularly discreet. As I read through the book, I realize that this is just an overarching theme that appears again and again and again. One of the questions about Christians as we move through life is how to duty and prudence or faith and responsibility, how do they, how do they intersect? Right? How do we move responsibly but also faithfully through this world? Um, the just word tradition is not new moral legislation. Uh, in fact, if you go through the just word criteria and you think about, for instance, a surgeon contemplating cutting off the leg of a child with gangrene, you would see the same things in effect. Is he a proper authority? Does he have the wherewithal to make that kind of decision? Is there an appropriate cause for doing this operation? Right, well, there is. There's the gangrene. Does he have the right intention, the child's health? Right, and you go through, and then you go through the prudential criteria. Is it the last resort? Is it proportionate? Right, do I have a probability of success? As you move through any conflict between moral goods, you begin to recognize the outline of the just war tradition. And so I think that becomes a, a framework that I see throughout various chapters. How do we move faithfully through this world um, and at the same time being responsible, loving both our God and our neighbor? And I'm going to leave it there. The rest of it's in the book. So. Yeah. Yeah.